I'm here this afternoon with Dr. Mark Pfeiffer. I appreciate very much you taking your time this afternoon uh, so that we can visit. You have an interesting story uh, of how you began your interest in the Middle East. You want to share a part of that? Yes, actually, um, it, it goes back to my early teen years. My, in my early teens, I just knew that I did not want to be a, a typical American suburbanite, you know, with a wife and 2.3 children, a dog and a cat. Uh, I wanted to see the world. I was interested in all the cultures and the languages and the foods and the people. And um, so when I went to college, I went to the University of Texas, I uh, originally thought I wanted to go into international relations, but there was no such major. You had to pick an area of the world and focus on that. So I chose the Middle East and majored in Middle Eastern studies. So it, uh, there, uh, even within Middle Eastern studies, we had to narrow our focus even further based upon the language, because we had to have two years of a Middle Eastern language, and I chose Persian as opposed to Arabic or Turkish or Urdu or, or Hebrew or any of the rest. And so that's where I zeroed in on Iran and became fascinated with the country of Iran. Understand that you actually moved over there and lived in Dubai, Dubai for a season. Tell me about that. Yes, I practiced law after my undergrad. I went to law school, and I practiced law 12 years. But um, basically, I realized one day uh, that if I am on my deathbed and all I've ever done is tried lawsuits, that I'm going to be really depressed with my life. And plus, it was um, the lifestyle, uh, the number of hours, and the stress, and everything was just not the life that. Uh, my wife and I wanted and so I resigned and I mean I, I had feelers out for different things and uh, all around the world not just locally and so I had an opportunity to move to Dubai and get involved in a new magazine publication called the International American and to get in on the ground floor and work as the editor of that magazine and so uh, at first, I thought there's no way that my wife would go for that, uh, but she did. She said it would be great, and so we moved, and uh, we lived in Dubai. We lived in Sharjah, which is another emirate within the UAE. We lived in, on the island of Cyprus for a couple oh, wow. of years, and so it was really fantastic. It was amazing, and, and uh, my kids still think of Dubai and the UAE as their home. Wow. So yeah, it was great. Um, while you were there, I understand that you traveled quite a bit into Iran. Um, tell me, since that's kind of a country that's in the news right now, tell me about the people, the culture, and what you learned while you were there. You know, it's hard to overstate the difference between the impressions we get from the news and the reality. Okay. Um, you know, in the news, we get nothing but you know demonstrations and flag burnings and death to America and nuclear weapons and and all of that. And all of the, that kind of stuff that's in the news is a very narrow layer at the very top. Their government, which is a theocracy and is a pretty extremist. Um, but the people of Iran it is a completely different thing. And so the people of Iran are wonderful. They are very hospitable, they're warm, they're loving, they love Americans. Good. Um, and so traveling in Iran uh, was really wonderful. I had nothing but wonderful times. All the times I was in Iran, the people were fantastic. And um, even uh, treated me, uh, I say, often like a rock star, you know, oh, because really? of being an American. And I have all kinds of stories, which I can share some of them if you want. <laughs> but uh, it was really fascinating. And of course, the culture is, you know, 3,000 years old. And Tell uh, me about it, the culture. Well, what, the, what the, the Persian like. Empire, of course, was at one time the greatest empire on the earth and it covered you know, huge swaths of the Middle East and Central Asia 
and uh, there was a rich culture, whether foods or architecture or handicrafts, um, there's all kinds of things, like the dome you often see with mosques. Well, the dome was borrowed from the Zoroastrians, the per which was the, the religion of Iran before the Islamic invasion. Uh, the mosaic tile work, the carpets, uh, the recipes, you know, they have recipes that are thousands of years old and they've been perfected and they're wonderful. So Iranian food is just amazing. It's my favorite. Um, and the people are, um, they're, a part of their culture is hospitality and warmth and um, so that they just are, seems totally, like you said, totally different than what we see on television. Yes, I mean, I, you know, people would, the strangers on the street, upon learning that I was an American, would beg me to come to their home for dinner, or really? stay overnight in their home, or whatever. Um, and so when I first went to Iran, I was a little afraid to tell people I was an American. Uh, well, I quickly got over that, and then eventually I started not telling people I was American because I got so tired of telling people, no, I'm sorry, I can't come to your home, you know, for a meal, because, you know, we were always on an itinerary that was pre-approved by the government and all these kinds of things, and so we couldn't really vary that, that itinerary. Wow. And so it was so heartbreaking to say, oh, no, thank you so much for your invitation, but, you know, I, I have to stay. Is that just simply culture, or is it uh, in their faith, or where does that hospitality come from? Well, the hospitality goes back ages, and, you know, in, you know, 2,000 years ago, 1,500 years ago, or whatever, um, being out at night, there were no motels or hotels, and so... Uh, there were caravan sarais where if you were, you know, had caravans, you could come in and bring your animals inside and all your trade goods inside and be safe from raiders or marauders or whatever for the night. But for common people, and, uh, the caravan sarais were spread and so they may not be where you would want to be if you were traveling. And so if you were traveling, um, it was just customary that you could go to any home and say, here I am, here's my family, uh, we need to stop for the night, and the, the homeowner had to take you in. Wow. And so uh, hospitality meant survival very often. Wow. And so it just became a thing that you, you know, you are duty bound to invite anyone who comes to your door, to invite them in and to take care of them and to give them the best of what you have. And so um, that can be very poignant sometimes because there are occasions where you can go into a person's home and, and accept their hospitality and they might be very, very poor, hmm. but they're gonna give the best of what they have to the guest and so it's like, I, I really would prefer you to keep, you know, these things that you need, this food or this bread or this tea or whatever that you need for your life, rather than give it to me who's, you know, a relatively wealthy Westerner. But that, you know, that would have been offensive to refuse what they offer and that's, they felt honored to be able to do that. So, you know, one of the things I tell Americans is that, you know, in Iran and in other places in the Middle East, that their hospitality puts us to shame, you know, because we would never like invite a stranger on our front porch steps to come into our house, you know. Uh, but there's a lot of things like that, and, uh, you know, I could go on and on and on with stories about tea, you know. they We have people out there who are wine connoisseurs and know you know, where wine comes from by tasting it, and they, they can go into great detail telling all about the different wines. Well, for Iranians, it's tea, and they have different grades of tea and different colors of tea and um, different ways to drink it, and it has to be a certain temperature and all that. So Amazing. all these kinds of things are, are just really fascinating. and, and um, So uh, I love Iran. I would go back. Uh, I miss it. Um, Sounds like it. I mean, it, it, 
for a lot of us in my generation, our first exposure really to Iran was when they had the captives for yeah. what, 444 days. Right. And what you're sharing is 180. Yes. To, to that visual picture that a lot of us were first awakened to that country existing. You know, the first time I went to Iran, uh, I had my wife and my kids, and um, we, we flew into uh, Mahrabad International Airport in Tehran. And um, we went through uh, passport control, and then we had our luggage, and with three young kids, there's a lot of luggage. So we were in the line for customs inspection. And so there's a big long line and they, they open every piece of luggage and go through it. So it's, it takes forever. It's not like, you know, ours here in the U.S. where nothing to declare go that way. Um, so there's a big long line and here we were standing there, we had our luggage, and there was a soldier in a military uniform with a machine gun strapped across his chest. And it became obvious he was in charge of security for this customs area. And he had a look on his face like, just give me an excuse. You know, Ouch. he looked like he was just ready to bite your head off. And so he was slowly coming down the line, looking at everybody and, and you know, kind of seeing if anything was amiss. And so he kept coming and he was eventually going to come to us. And so I was a little bit worried. You know, because this is our first time. We had no idea. And he finally got to me and he stopped. And he looked at me and he said, where are you from? And I thought, God, we didn't even make it out of the airport, you know. <laughs> but I said, well, you know, I, 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 there's no point in lying. They know, you know, they know that we're American. So I said, well, we're American. And his face lit up. And he said, America, you know, like brothers, he said, why are you standing in this line? Come, come. He took us out of the line, wow. escorted us past everybody in line, past the customs inspectors. Oh, wow. He gave them a look, you know, and then we just went on right on out into the, to the lobby area, and uh, he took us and, and took us all the way to our tour guide and wow. said, have a wonderful time in Iran. And so I thought, wow, that's, you know, that's not what I was expecting. And I have, you know, several other stories like that where um, we bypassed even, you know, passport control lines. They would take me from the line once they saw I was an American and take my passport and walk me to the front and elbow the guy in the front of the line out of the way, move his passport out of the way, put my passport down and say, American. And so, I mean, I was treated wonderfully in where, Iran. Where, where do you think that stems from? Do you think that that's any byproduct of the, from the experience when they had our cap, held our men captive? You know, I think um, that that's a good question, and and opinions may vary, but I think that most Iranians really admire the United States and our culture and our freedoms and our economic opportunity and our prosperity and all of that. They may have trouble with some of our government policies. Um, you know, they wonder why we support Israel. Um, they, you know, we have done some pretty bad things to Iran. Our military shot down a commercial airliner and killed 300 something people. You know, oh, wow. uh, people, you know, most Americans, that's a blip on the news from, you know, 15 or 20 years ago, and they don't even remember it anymore. But um, Iranians remember it. Sure. Um, we overthrew a duly elected government in Iran, the government of Mossadegh and the CIA, Operation Ajax. We overthrew that government and installed our own person. So um, Iranians have reasons to not like uh, the American government. And so, you know, government policy and some of the government actions they don't like, but the, the overall system and the people, they really love and they, they emulate. And, and many of them wish they could replace their government, have an open secular democracy, and uh, become a lot more like the United States. So, 
you know, it, it was a, it's a wonderful country. There's so much history. There's so much culture. There's so much beautiful artwork and architecture and on and on and on. And it's really a shame that they get such a, a bad rap because all we show on the news is, you know, the bad stuff, the flamboyant stuff. I understand that back in the 60s, they, their culture and their attire and everything was more Western, like we are today. Yes. But now it has greatly changed because of the, uh, I guess the religion changed there and they're in their barcas and... Well, what happened was the Shaw, um, the, the, the culture and everything was very Westernized and some even referred to Iran as the 51st state. We had very close relations, and so the people did not mind that. But the Shah went way too far in trying to remove Islam from from the country and the culture. I mean, he went. He just really tried to, you know, put it in the corner and and make it an afterthought. And um, so the 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 clerical. Uh, interests and some of the more religious people really did not like that he was disrespecting Islam and trying to minimize Islam and you know he held a, a magnificent unbelievable celebration of, of the 2500, 2500 year anniversary of the Persian Empire at Persepolis and, and dignitaries from all over the world came and you know, there were hundreds of these tents set up in the desert that were luxury, you know, wow. five-star food, and, and, you know, they really did it fancy. They had a tremendous program, and in the whole thing, there was no mention of Islam, there was no symbols of Islam, there, it was as if Islam didn't even exist. Now, what year, time frame, was that? I think that point? was... I, think it was around 75, but I can't really okay. remember. That may not be right. Um, I don't know the year, but for some reason 75 comes to my mind. Um, and of course also the Shah's regime um, was thought to be weak in that some of his deals, like with foreign oil companies, were seen to be far too one-sided toward the foreign oil company and, and really a bad deal for the Iranian economy and the Iranian people. And uh, Also, he had a very brutal uh, intelligence um, apparatus, the Samak, and it was very, very brutal. And so um, there was a convergence of all these things that kind of bubbled up. The, the revolution originally was not an Islamic revolution, it was just an anti-Shah revolution. Oh. And then there was a period of about 18 months where there were various parties trying to, to vie for control of the new government and through a bunch of historical details that are uh, not of much interest now, um, the Islamic party ended up prevailing and it became an Islamic republic. But it wasn't a, a revolution in favor of Islam originally. It just sort of became that. Um, Do you have any information on, I mean, from a woman's perspective, to have gone from the, you know, Western civilization type of culture to then moving into the Islamic influence of the burqas and the everything else and their rights, I'm assuming, that they're falling like the other Muslims where they... Uh, can't drive and um, all of the other things like that. What happened in that regard? Do you? Well, that's a good question. In Iran, uh, the women can drive. Okay. That's really only Saudi. And um, women have more rights in Iran than relative to some of the other Muslim countries. However, it was a stark change. And basically, what happened was. There were, uh, there were sort of unofficial uh, bands of young men who were enforcers of the new Islamic um, modesty and everything else. And so basically the government dictated that from now on women had to cover. And the traditional 
Iranian Islamic covering for women is called the chador, which is the big flowing black robes. Uh, but also then they have what's called a manto, which is more like a, a, a London fog raincoat with a scarf. But regardless, that became mandatory. Makeup became illegal. And so there was a period there where those rules were very violently and um, brutally enforced. And so the population got the message very quickly. So they had to subdue the women to... To well, they had to subdue the men too. I mean, men could no longer wear short sleeves. They had to wear long sleeves. Wow. And so there are stories, which I have no reason to doubt, that they would spray paint men's arms, you know, because they didn't have on long sleeves. Or they would throw acid in a woman's face for wearing makeup, or slice off her lips with a razor because she had a lipstick. So they were very, very brutal. Wow. And so um, very quickly the Iranian people said, wait a minute, this is not what we signed up for. And so... Uh, they were not able to, to fight back and push back? No, well, see what happened is uh, right after this Islamic party took over, Saddam invaded. And so we had an eight-year war, Iran-Iraq war, which was extremely bloody. Um, estimates are that Iran lost a million people oh, in that wow. war. Oh. And there were Scud missiles landing in Tehran. And so the country quickly shifted from, wait a minute, this regime is terrible, we don't like this, to we've got to survive as a people in this very terrible war. And so when that war was over then, the people began to turn back to domestic issues and the nature of this regime and um, so since then really there have, there's been a strong movement, a strong um, desire to replace this government but they're not able to because the, the government cracks down very viciously on the people whenever they demonstrate or whatever and so uh, the, the, the intelligence service now under this regime is just as bad or worse than the intelligence server service under the Shah. And so they viciously, you know, enforce uh, the Islamic rules and they viciously punish anybody who is thought to be against the regime. Wow. And, um, you know, Christians are, are jailed and persecuted, uh, beaten, killed, because they are seen not just as converts, uh, from Islam to Christianity, which would be bad enough, but because the official religion is Shiite Islam, they're seen as traitors to their country, and so it's so it is a state um, required religion. Yes. Now it's not it's not required of people who are historically traditionally Christian, or Jew, or Zoroastrian. Those people are entitled to be those religions. They're they're forced to stay within their own confines, not do any sort of evangelism or, you know, trying to convert people to Islam. So the problem is not being, say, an Armenian Christian or an Assyrian Christian or a Jew. It's when you attempt to convert someone or if someone on their own converts away from Islam, um, then they're in big trouble. And so um, there's been much repression because lots and lots and lots of Iranians have converted uh, out of Islam into Christianity. And so there's hundreds of thousands, if not a million or two million, that have converted to Christianity. And so it's the numbers have gotten away from the government now. They've shifted to just arresting and persecuting leadership rather than rank and file because there's too many now that have converted. But it's seen as a, an act of um, um, treason to, to convert and leave Islam. So the government, I'm going to assume, is all Islamic. Uh, somebody who is Christian or Jew or any other faith would not be able to move up in any kind of government role. Yes, with the exception of parliament, they have um, 
certain a certain number of spots reserved really for Christian or Jew or Zoroastrian no more you know you're limited you know to those spots but they do have representation it's there's not enough is it a numbers. name only because no, are they effective they, they can't really do anything because they're so few yeah. you know there I don't know the exact numbers but there might be two out of however many for Christians and one for Jews so it's really sort of symbolic token yes. uh, they don't have any power to do anything yeah. but uh, they you know they do have those spots so and there's freedom of religion in Iran provided you stay with the religion of your birth um, so there's you know I've driven by a synagogue in Tehran there's a synagogue in Tehran hmm. um, there are um, Armenian churches in Iran. And if you Google, you know, do Google image church buildings in Iran, you'll see them. They're there. Uh, but it's, you know, it's traditional for, you know, generations, thousands of years, whatever. You know, Christians from Armenia or Assyrian Christians or whatever are Jews. But as long as they stay in their own little enclave, then they're, they're okay. So when you were talking about the hospitality that the Iran, Iranians um, had toward your, you and your family, um, were they Muslim, were they Christian, were they Jewish, were they a little bit of everything? Mostly all Muslim because really? it's 98% Muslim. And um, so yeah, I was all, almost always Muslim. And so, you know, you, you know, people don't wear identifying clothing really. Uh, everybody, all the women have to dress according to the Islamic rules, no matter what your religion. And the men all dress more or less in a Western way. So there's no way to identify who's who. But since it's overwhelmingly Muslim anyway, you just, you know, you know it's pretty much going to be the Muslims that you interact with anytime, anywhere you go. And it doesn't, it doesn't really matter. I mean, it's just uh, the people there are really you know, really nice and really great, and I miss being there. I, you know, if my life circumstances allowed, I would, you know, visit there again, and um, I would take people. I'd love to take Americans and say, let's go to Iran. You experience it. Uh, in fact, I did one time. I had two, uh, well, one acquaintance and another guy I didn't even know, but they were traveling through Dubai on their way to India, and I said, you guys, if you're going to come through Dubai, set aside a few extra days and let me take you into Iran. And we went. And so before we went, I said, okay, now here's what you're going to find. You know, the hospitality, the warmth, the blah, blah, blah. It's, you know, we were going to be, we didn't have time to do anything except Tehran and then northern Tehran, which is the most western. And I said, you're going to be shocked at how much different it is than what you think it's going to be. Wow. And so after the first day, in the evening, we gathered for dinner, and I said, okay, well, what did y'all think? And they said, gosh, you just cannot believe how, you know, nice and western and warm and, you know, it's just totally different than what we thought. And I said, well, didn't I tell you that? And they said, yeah, but it just didn't sink in until we experienced it. So, um, you know, not only that, but there are historical sites in Iran that are breathtaking. Persepolis, and uh, there's just so many. Uh, the bazaars are you know, thousands of years old. It, it's a wonderful place to visit, and it's probably the best kept secret in the world in terms of tourism because of all the geopolitical tension yeah. and, and, the, and the misimpressions that we get uh, about the country as a whole from the news. But it's, it is a, a wonderful place to visit. Well, speaking of the news, can't talk about Iran without mentioning the bomb yeah. and all that's going on. What are your thoughts on? Um, Iran wants the nuclear bomb. Um, all of their protestations to the contrary uh, to be ignored. They, they are interested in the bomb. They, um, a part of it is simply national pride. You know, if we have the ability to get it, uh, Israel has it, India, Pakistan, European countries, the United States, Russia, all these other countries. Um, well, why can't we? You know, 
why are we any different than anybody else? So there's an element of national pride to it, but there's, um, the Iranian constitution has written in it that uh, expansion. They want to expand the Islamic Republic around the world until it, Islam rules the world. Oh, wow. And so for them to be able to do that, they have to be militarily much, much more powerful than they are. So when the Iran-Iraq war took place, Saddam invaded. They were able to run Saddam back out. Then they tried to you know, move the boundary into Iraq and take over Iraq, which you know, that was their original first target because Iraq's population is 70, 60, 70% Shiite. So they were, Iraq was their first target. So they, this was sort of a very you know, bad thing, the invasion, but it turned into an opportunity for them to go ahead and expand and take over Iraq, and they were not able to do it, despite having two or three times the population of Iraq and a much stronger military. So from that point on, they knew if they were ever going to achieve their goals, they needed um, weapons. So they've had this clandestine nuclear program, I think it was 18 years before the IAEA even discovered that they had it. And so um, I have no doubt that they are going to seek the bomb. They're seeking the bomb. I don't know how close they are to it. Uh, I think these negotiations that we're having are kind of a ruse. I think they just want the sanctions relief and then they're going to keep right on doing whatever they want to do toward getting the bomb. And of course, um, uh, past President Ahmadinejad has made extraordinarily inflammatory statements about wiping Israel off the map and Israel being a cancer that must be removed from the body and this and that. And uh, another former president who is still very powerful in one of the ruling Islamic councils of the, the government, uh, Rafsanjani, has said it's quite rational to predict a nuclear bomb going off in Israel and destroying everything. So um, I, it's going to be, it, the world will be much different uh, when Iran gets the bomb, and I don't have any doubt they're going to have it. Um, even I believe, I'm not really an expert, I haven't followed these negotiations closely, but I believe President Obama has even said this deal does not prevent them from getting the bomb, it just delays them. So I also know that uh, other Arab countries in the region, such as Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates and others are, are shaking in their boots about Iran getting a weapon. Because Iran has, um, well, the Houthi rebels in Yemen, you know, they're, they have designs on expanding uh, with their, you know, vassal states within the region. So, Iraq is headed that way, um, to, it's almost under Iran control, and Yemen, if there were no pushback, Yemen would be under Iranian control. Southern Lebanon with the Hezbollah is under Iranian control. And there, there was at least one major effort by a Shiite group in Mecca to take over the, the Holy Mosque and the Kaaba and all that in Mecca. And they actually did control it for a period of time until French commandos came in and were able to defeat them. So these Arab countries are very frightened of the Iranian expansionist history as well as intentions in the future. And so uh, they are not going to be happy at all about uh, Iran getting a nuclear weapon. So I, do, I just don't see a way for there to be any happy outcome. No, to it doesn't this. sound like I, it, it, it seems like it's a foregone conclusion that these regional rivalries, uh, the Sunni Shiite rivalry, you know, all of this a push for control and uh, all that in the Middle East is going to go from uh, proxy groups and conventional weapons to state actors with nuclear weapons. And, you know, the, the, not the common people, but the very, very religious Shiites and some of those in the government 
believe that they can help bring about the end times and um, you know that the nuclear weapon is a part of the program to help bring about the really? end times wow. and the return of the Mahdi, the 12th Imam and all of this. So I am not optimistic about the situation there. Mm, doesn't sound like it. Um, you're back in the States now. What, uh, having come back to the States from living there and all of that experience, and you love the place, it's yes. obvious, it shows. What are you doing now? Are you doing anything still in relationship with them, or well, where, where's I, your life I now? Haven't, I haven't been back to the Middle East, but um, I now have the Christian Institute of Islamic Studies. And so um, I've been, I've had this about five years. It's a 501c3 nonprofit. And um, we kind of do two things. One is I teach Islamic studies courses at uh, Christian colleges and universities, uh, mostly online. Uh, the technology now is phenomenal. Yes, and I just love that because, you know, it used to be not very long ago, if it wasn't in person, you know, that's, that's the only uh, students you could teach. So now it can be all over the nation or even around the world. Yes. So uh, I'm growing the number of uh, colleges at which I offer these courses to Wonderful. their students online. So I'm really excited about that. And I also um, do training seminars and speaking to churches, uh, but other you know, uh, non-sectarian organizations, secular organizations talking about Islam and various aspects of Islam. Uh, the church trainings are basically to help Christians understand Islam and understand how to, you know, be friends with Iranian, not Iranian, Muslims, and have uh, good relationships with Muslims, and how to have spiritual conversations about Christianity and about Islam that are very fruitful, and how if a Muslim is interested, how a, a Christian person can help them understand the gospel and come to faith in Christ. So I, I do that as often as I'm invited. Um, and I, I've, uh, I've spoken at a uh, crisis pregnancy center and trained their staff on cultural things and things about Islam so that when Muslim women or Muslim couples come in, like what? What? Uh, they can they can better know how to interact with them respectfully, so they understand. Well, um, things like gender, um, gender boundaries, and um, uh, family dynamics. Uh, of course, you know, there's there's always a lot of exceptions, but there is sort of a typical family dynamic in a family, a Muslim family. Um, how women are viewed in Islam, um, uh, some of that stuff. Um, and so I spent half a day with them. That was very rewarding. Um, and then I've spoken at things like the conference recently in San Angelo, talking about Shiite Islam, uh, Islamic eschatology, end times, you know, what they believe about the end times in Iran and the bomb and Israel and all that stuff. Um, so I do some speaking also that is not necessarily religious, but just about Islam or about geopolitical implications of Islam or whatever. Very good. Well, I appreciate your time this afternoon. You have definitely opened my eyes to a new perspective on Iranians and their outlook toward America. Yes, I know that uh, people who view this are going to be skeptical, and there's no way to get around that because this uh, message is so different from what they've they've heard. But um, you know, I I will go anywhere that I'm invited to speak, and so if anybody that's watching would like to have me come uh, to speak about any of these things. Um, I guess I should plug my website. Sure, which and is, I'll uh, and I'll put it up too. It's a uh, uh, TCIIS.org, the Christian Institute of Islamic Studies.org. And so you can find out about um, what we do there, my bio, my book, you know, all the typical stuff that would be on the website, my speaking schedule, and how to contact me. So 
everything, and how to donate. <laughs> if Absolutely. You, if you want to support our work, uh, we rely just on uh, contributions from private individuals, so we, we always need more help financially. But yes, all of that would be on the website, uh, tciis.org, and so for any further information that anybody needs, they can reach me there. Wonderful. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Thank you for, for being here.